So we've had the first edition, which was about the British experience with Dave Rich and Matt Bolton a couple of weeks ago. And we turn now to the second edition, which is anti-Semitism and the left in Germany. Um, so the debate about left bank anti-Semitism is a contentious or has been a contentious issue since at least German unification uh, in 1990. So we have today to distinguish uh, distinguish guests uh, on our uh, webinar and our uh, podcast. And this is first, I will introduce them briefly. That is first, uh, Dr. Christina uh, Achinger, who is Associate Pro Professor of German Studies at the University of Warwick. And she has published widely on various topics such as the Holocaust, race and gender, critical theory, and in particular, anti-Semitism in literature and politics. So uh, her recent uh, publication is an edited volume together with the late Robert Fine uh, called Antisemitism, Racism and Islamophobia, Distorted Faces of Modernity, published by Routledge in 2015. And she's also a member of various networks on antisemitism and racism. Our second guest, uh, our guest second speaker is Dr. Sebastian Vogt. Uh, who is um, a, um, a member of the Institute for Contemporary History in Munich, Munich, and he has also published widely on Jewish history, the workers' movement, and anti-Semitism. Uh, plus this, he was, for, he was for many years uh, a very active member of the working group Shalom uh, by, uh, of the party Die Linke, the left in Germany, and he, was, he has been an outspoken critic of, uh, of left-wing anti-Semitism within the party and beyond. <clears throat> and he is also about to publish a book on anti-Semitism with the German Bundeszentrale für politische Bildung, um, uh, the federal agency for civic education. So my two colleagues here are uh, Professor Gideon Reveni, who is Professor of Modern European History and the Director of the Sussex Weidenfeld Institute of Jewish Studies, and Professor Ivo Geber, who is Professor of Political Journalism and also a journalist, especially of the BBC, and uh, covering labor, the left, and more recently also anti-Semitism. So that is the introduction. We want to start with, um, I want to ask you, Christina and Sebastian, to uh, give a, a short introduction into the topic before we start a, a conversation. Okay, thank you very much, David and uh, Gideon and Ivo for inviting me and giving me the chance to talk. First, one correction, David, I will unfortunately not publish a book with the Bundeszentrale für politische Bildung. Maybe if uh, I'm a little bit more famous, I will get the chance to do it. Um, excuse, as, as you've already heard, English is not my um, mother tongue, so excuse my German accent. I despite all the English talks I gave, never managed to actually get rid of my accent. So I will um, start with, I, which I think is a very important point. The first question is, why should we care about left-wing anti-Semitism? And for a long time, and there are many examples uh, I could give you, that being left and being anti-Semitic exclude each other. There's one famous quote, for example, by a communist poet, Erich Fried, uh, Austrian-born, German-speaking um, uh, poet, who said, links und antisemitisch schließen sich aus, they exclude each other. And I think this is a wrong position. It's a denial of a specific leftist anti-Semitism and the refusal to really deal with it. It's just like putting it away and not getting into it. And I think, and uh, Christine will elaborate more on it afterwards, there is a specific leftist anti-Semitism that is connected to a certain analysis of the modern world. And I would put it like, a, uh, I don't know if it works in English, shortened anti-capitalism. In German, it's for kürzter anti-capitalismus, like a wrong kind of anti-capitalism uh, anti that does not see capitalism as a complex social structure with abstract rules and necessities everyone has to follow, like even the capitalist or the owner of the means of production. And so this in conclusion means not the individual is primarily be primarily responsible for the evil in the world. So it's not a question of character, but there are abstract forces resulting from the logic of a capitalist economy. And thus criticism of 
the modern society of bourgeois society should not be too much moralizing. And this often has, happens, I think, in a leftist view on modern society. So it's this kind of money cake, black and wild worldview. And to understand how this developed, it's necessary to go to the historical roots of it. And this would be the early phase of the labor movement. And pardon me for like taking you in a very superficial, but I think necessary excourse uh, to the history of the labor movements, because knowing these roots are necessary to understand the developments after 1945, after National Socialism and after the Holocaust, and especially to understand the German specificity. So some brief comments. The so-called Jewish question, which is in, you, in, in German, it sounds very harsh, Judenfrage, which was relevant since at least the mid 19th century, this was also the beginning of the labor movement. So the first organization, this was uh, the discussion about the role of Jews in society. And the most famous um, writing from the labor movement at this time, very early labor movement was Karl Marx. He wrote a book in 1844 called uh, Zur Judenfrage on the Jewish question. And this is a highly discussed a book with very different interpretation. I just want to give a very short, because Marx, on the one hand, supported the political emancipation of Jews, in contrast to many of his contemporaries, but he was against Judaism as a religion. And he was equating Judaism with egoism and identifies the Jews with money. And you already know these kind of stereotypes, which uh, have, a, unfortunately, a very long history. So Judaism and the Jews were seen as, in some form, the embodiments of the modern bourgeois society. And therefore, the emancipation of Jews can only be um, achieved by abolishing modern capitalistic society. And there's one famous quote I will give you in German and then translate it. Uh, die gesellschaftliche Emanzipation des Juden ist die Emanzipation der Gesellschaft vom Judentum. So the social emancipation of the Jew is the emancipation of the society uh, from Judaism. And this is a typical thought from uh, the labor movement, Jews as the embodiment of modernity, money, financial system. Then there is one other uh, thinker and a party leader of the Social Democrats, the SPD, the German Labour Party, uh, August Bebel, who was the most important person in the late 19th century, and he gave a talk about anti-Semitism, and there was a resolution in 1892, which was very uh, important at this time, and this was the phase when anti-Semitism, first as a term, the terminology was coined by Wilhelm Ma, a German anti-Semite. In the 1980s, he termed this, uh, this term, and anti-Semitism became a political movement. There were anti-Semitic clubs, there were anti-Semitic parties. It was the first international anti-Semitic conference in 1930, uh, 90, uh, 1893 in Dresden, in Saxony, and so the Social Democrats had to deal with it. And the Jewish question by the Social Democrats, and this is a big difference to many other interpreta interpretation at this time, they saw the Jewish question not as a religious one, but as an economic one with kind of a material base. Thus, uh, anti-Semitism was coming from the competitive structure of the modern economy. Jews were seen as competitor, competitors by many uh, members of the petit bourgeois, that's why they became anti-Semite. This is very shortly put, but in this perspective, anti-Semitism is a force that is against the natural evolution of society. And this, of course, is connected to this kind of uh, philosophical, historical view, like a teleological development towards socialism. And anti-Semitism is kind of a hindrance in this development. Therefore, the SPD has to fight against it. And, and this is another important point, and uh, I will come to an end shortly. Uh, 
the anti-Semites will unwillingly contribute to the rise of socialism, as anti-Semites anti will in the end recognize that not the Jew as an individual, but capitalism as a system is the problem. Therefore, they will turn revolutionary. And this is in a very abstract form, anti-Semitism as a shortened anti-capitalism. And anti-Semitism is seen as a means by the bourgeoisie to divide the proletariat and like um, um, divide or um, uplenken, like sub subtract uh, from the class struggle. And there's one famous quote by uh, Babel who said, the anti-Semites will sow, we will reap. And this is in the end, we will benefit from anti-Semitism or the anti-Semitic. Uh, and one last quote, and this is very um, famous, uh, Antisemitismus ist der Sozialismus der dummen Kerle. Like anti-Semitism anti, uh, anti is the socialism of the silly or the dumb guys. And in this perspective, in this of the labor movement, they underestimate the ideological and mass psychological factors of anti-Semitism. And they only see it as a means to something else and not as a means in itself. Despite the weakness in the analysis of the labor movement, they were the first to take social and economic factors into account. And they saw anti-Semitism as a result of social circumstances and not as some kind of like individual uh, stupid uh, idea, but they try to explain it out of the social uh, circumstances. And and this is my last uh, my 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 last point. Uh, the SPD, the uh, labor movement, was attacked as a Judenschutztruppe. Really hard to translate, like a. Um, protective force of the Jews. And one reason was that many party leaders of the SPD had a Jewish background. For example, in the Weimar Republic from 1980, uh, 18, 10% of the MPs, the members of parliament of the SPD were Jewish. So, and this was possible in the Social Democratic Party, which was not possible in most other parties. So despite all my criticism against the labor movement. And despite all the shortnesses and weaknesses in the theoretical analysis, as a political force, they were the most important political force to fight against anti-Semitism together with Jewish organizations. And despite the theoretical weaknesses, these kind of weaknesses are different in the 19th or early 20th century compared to after 1945, after the Holocaust. And no one could foresee Auschwitz and the genocidal anti-Semitism, but the left could have tried after 1945 to grasp it, to understand it. And if it has done so, Christine will answer it. Thank you. Thanks. And, and first of all, thanks also from me to, to David, Gideon, and Evo Eivold for inviting me. And I think this is a really interesting project. So yes, taking it up from uh, 1945, obviously, as Sebastian has already said, this is a whole new story suddenly. So most importantly, we now are talking about anti-Semitism um, after the Holocaust. So an anti-Semitism that has to somehow grapple with the fact that this has happened, very different from the social democracy of the Kaiserreich. We also now have a world with two German states and we have the foundation of Israel and all these new facts will, will impact on the left-wing discourse in the two and then later on in the unified Germany. Um, I'd like to say very briefly that in spite of, of these very specific conditions and also the specificities of left-wing anti-Semitism in the post-war years, we can still recognize some of the overall patterns of a specifically modern anti-Semitism. And I won't go into that now, but basically we're talking about this idea that the Jews are somehow in league with the dark forces of capitalist modernity or a kind of secret conspiracy. Uh, and also that they represent something like an anti-national principle. So they're the enemy, not just of the German people, but of all peoples, because they represent those forces of modernity that um, undermine grown communities like egoism, lust for money, 
competition, individualism, abstract forms of social mediation, etc. And I think it's important to uh, be reminded of that because this works very differently from uh, dominant forms of, shall we say, colonial racism, for example. Um, but maybe we can uh, come back to that at some more appropriate point. So starting with the GDR, um, in some ways the GDR is the heir of um, some of those simplistic forms of critiques of capitalism and imperialism that Sebastian has already outlined. Um, and the GDR dealt with the, the burden of being the successor, one of the successor nations of national Germany, uh, national socialist Germany, if you want, uh, by simply completely sidelining that aspect. So the GDR defined itself as the heir of the anti-fascist resistance. Um, and it understood national socialism uh, in a very simplistic way as just a form of fascism. And fascism was defined as basically the dictatorship of finance capital about over the working peoples of the world, if you want. Um, and secondly, GDR ideology is shaped by a simplistic form of anti-imperialism that it shares with many other countries of the Eastern Bloc that basically pits two camps against, against each other. On the one hand, the warmongering capitalist imperialist countries under the leadership of the USA, um, of rather the elites in those countries. And on the other hand, the camp of peace, i.e. the socialist states of the Eastern Bloc, communist parties, and generally the peoples of the rest of the world. And especially from the late 40s, early 50s onwards, this fuses with uh, the rise of Stalinist anti-Zionism. And here, Zionism and its agents all over the world uh, are seen as in league with imperialism, serving the interests of capital, and in particular Jewish capital in Israel, in undermining and subduing the peaceful peoples of the world. So you can kind of recognize echoes of, of the idea of a Jewish world conspiracy. And accordingly, this also manifests itself, for example, in a series of anti-Semitic show trials uh, in the early 50s, where mostly Jewish Communist Party functionaries are unmasked as agents of Zionism, uh, and in most cases executed. So in the um, FRG, things look slightly different, but we also can see in the first, shall we say, decade uh, after the war, a real reluctance to engage with the racially and anti-Semitically motivated National Socialist crimes against Jews, Sinti and Roma, or also the racial aspects of the war in Eastern Europe. That starts to change in the 1960s after some high profile trials against Eichmann in Jerusalem, for example, or the Auschwitz trials in Frankfurt. Nevertheless, this beginning recognition of German crimes is still reluctant, partial, incomplete, and we see a strong, though often covert persistence of older anti-Semitic thinking, um, not just on the right, but also uh, in parts of the left. And we can also see in that context uh, attempts to minimize Jewish victim status by portraying Jews as perpetrators of equivalent or worse crimes. So in particular, this is connected with the idea that Israel does to the Palestinians what the Nazis did to the Jews and similar um, statements. So if Jews are not victims, but also perpetrators, just as we were, then in a way, German guilt is relativized or even we quits. It's a, a romanticizing image of the Palestinians as an authentic autochthonous people rooted in the land against Israel as the um, Zionist artifact, as an artificial construct, the Jews as a non-people who are planted in this region where they have nothing um, to do, and we can kind of recognize some of the uh, older patterns of modern anti-Semitism here, I think. Um, and I think it's worth noting that these descriptions of Israel as a quasi-Nazi state, which are and were common in other countries too, have of course quite a different meaning in Germany, because here they're not just a vilification or delegitimizing uh, of the state of Israel, but in fighting Israel as the new Nazis, young Germans rid themselves of their troublesome his historical heritage in, in a twofold way. In uh, firstly, if the former victims are now themselves the Nazis, then the crimes of the parent generation are kind of canceled out. And secondly, in fighting Nazism in Israel, um, 
Germans are no, no longer the heirs of the responsibility for their parents' crimes, but they're suddenly on the other side of history as part of a new kind of anti-fascist resistance. In the context of um, the disappearance of an Eastern Bloc that leads to a kind of disorientation of the left, even among those who did not identify with um, Soviet communism, uh, and in the context of an increasing nationalism in the German mainstream and also uh, in the German left uh, due to the influence now of GDR discourses that merge with, with the West German uh, left debates. And so now we see the emergence of um, currents within the German left calling themselves either anti-national or anti-German that see their prime role in the opposition to nationalism in general and specifically uh, to German nationalism and in the struggle against anti-Semitism and simplistic essentialist forms of anti-imperialism on the left. Again, we can maybe talk later about what might be some contributing factors here. And I think that is really something that kind of distinguishes the German and to some degree the Austrian left of today uh, from left-wing movements in other countries, that there is a very pronounced uh, not generalized, but a pronounced critique in parts of the left, including the radical left, of these of phenomena that, that uh, Sebastian has already called foreshortened anti-capitalism, simplistic binary views of the world, and in particular, the role of um, anti-Semitic forms of criticism of Israel um, play in that context. Um, I think I'm going to leave it here. What I would maybe like to discuss later is the degree to which this criticism isn't just a criticism by the left of the left, but is also rec recognizably left wing in the way it analyzes these phenomena. I think that would be quite interesting. And maybe we can also come to the question like why, why should we even care about these phenomena um, in the discussion? So sorry for going on for a little bit here. Sure. What are the main sources of left wing anti-Semitism in Germany? It's hard to separate these different um, manifestations of, of an anti-Semitic worldview. That's kind of part of why I try to start with saying these are all manifestations of a sort of underlying structure uh, of a binary perception of Jews stroke Israel as being in league with the dark forces of modernity against the sort of natural good um, unified peoples of the world. And I think, um, that is kind of what gives this whole discourse of about Israel its, its uh, symbolic power. I mean, it isn't actually in many cases about Israel and Palestinians at all. And often if you talk to people, they know next to nothing about what is actually going on in both societies, that they're both deeply divided about the, the deep and, and intractable historical, ethical, political um, dilemmata of, of this conflict. But it comes to stand just for this kind of Manichaean perception of good against evil, imperial powers against, you know, the working working people of the world, and and more recently also, then becomes associated with all kinds of uh, movements to protect native peoples, for example, First Nations, even now to to protect the environment, to fight against uh, climate change. So this is all located on on the side of the good against kind of Israel and the side of the bad, and and. And um, while you also do have direct expressions of anti-Semitism, of course, you have Holocaust denial on the left, you have, uh, for example, in the 60s, 70s, you have attacks against Jewish bankers, or even in the Occupy movement more recently, attacks against Jewish speculators uh, in the kind of squatting battles in, in Frankfurt. Um, in a way, Israel is the most convenient way of, of, of going around sort of direct references to Jews, if you want. But then it, they sort of come back in the back door because, because, of course, Jews are associated with Israel no matter where they live. So you have attacks against synagogues um, for whatever Israel does in the Gaza Strip. Um, and so I think all these phenomena that you describe are kind of interconnected and, and very hard to, to prize apart. Yeah, I basically agree and just want to add some things to what uh, you said, Christine. David, of course, I did not mention Israel too much as it was not founded uh, in the period, period I was talking about. But interestingly, you can actually find anti-Zionism anti within the German labor movement, especially within the Communist Party, before the foundation of Israel. 
There is one colleague of us, Olaf Kistenmacher from Hamburg, who intensively researched uh, the writings of the Communist Party. And even in the 1920s, the Jews were seen as not being able to found a state. And you have this kind of stateless resentment, Jews as somehow different. They are not even a normal nation. They cannot found a state like others. So the resentment or the hatred against Jews, um, this is what uh, Christina has already mentioned, is different than other forms of nationalism or hatred, for example, against the French or the British or so. The Germans hated the French and fought several wars for, for hundreds of years, but they could look to them like eye to eye. They were both nations, they hated each other, they were seen as what is called like Erbfeind in German, like inherited enemy, and the Jews, they were out of the picture. They were like the third things, they did not fit into this um, notion of nation state. So from the earliest resentments uh, in anti-Semitism, Jews were seen as like not being able uh, to found a state. So, but nevertheless, uh, I have, of course, not mentioned Israel too much. And the problem is, or the very hard thing when we talk about anti-Semitism <clears throat> is to really distinguish all these different forms of anti-Semitism. And what I was talking about, um, I, I would call maybe a structural anti-Semitism. You can have an anti-Semitic argument without talking about Jews or talking about um, Israel. Um, and this works with, if you have this money cake worldview, like black and white, good and bad, good and evil, and you structure your whole notion of the world in this context, I would call this structural anti-Semitic. On the other hand, we have this uh, Israel-related anti-Semitism, which I think today, at least in the current discourse, when we talk about the current conflict, is the most dominant one, or the, the one that can be seen most on the streets, on, on demonstration. And this is not to say that every critique or criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. This is bullshit. Israel is you, you hear so much criticism of Israel all around Germany. In the media, you have uh, on the streets, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, it's completely legitimate to criticize the right-wing government of Israel, but to distinguish, or it's really hard to define at what point this criticism of Israel like um, turns into an anti-Semitism. And there's one suggestion I still find very helpful to distinguish these um, forms of criticism versus anti-Semitism. It's a so-called 3D test, um, very uh, short phrase, but uh, if Israel is, uh, is the delegitimation of Israel, the defamation of Israel, and double standards against Israel, so these 3D tests, if a critique, criticism of Israel fails these three Ds, then it turns into an anti-Semitic uh, form of um, critique. What they actually do, and this might be an interesting phenomenon, I think you see in Britain maybe even more than in Germany, that you have leftist people like cooperating with um, Islamic uh, organizations which are at heart reactionary. And so it somehow doesn't count how they are politically, but uh, yeah, and it's really hard to distinguish these different forms of anti-Semitism. So do you, do, do you recognize that actually in a, in a bizarre sort of way, the Holocaust has not fundamentally changed the nature of left anti-Semitism in Germany? No, I don't agree uh, to what you say. I think you're very right that we find similarities concerning a certain form of anti-capitalism, like this moralizing worldview, binary worldview, the few against the many. And I mean, this is typical for anti-Semitism. You often don't have to say Jews, but you have these chiffres. You have like the few, the media, the East Coast elite, the financial system. You don't have to actually say Jews, but people will understand it. Nevertheless, despite these similarities, I would argue that um, there are big, big differences between 
the nations that were part of the national socialistic nation, meaning Germany and Austria and all other nations. And I mean, the British colonial history, of course, somehow play into it. And you, you could answer it much more or know it much better. But in Germany, there is, and this is specific for Germany, what Christine was pointing out, what is called in the research, in the, the academic discussion, secondary antisemitism. It is, we Germans, to, to put it polemically, we Germans will never forgive the Jews Auschwitz. Because Auschwitz, or the, every living Jew, is a reminder of the German crimes. And is a reminder of what my father or grandfather has done. And thus, is an obstacle to build again or rebuild a form of German nationalism. So, and if you look at um, uh, anti-Semit or polls on anti-Semitism and uh, the attitude towards Jews in in Germany, you have many, many people saying the Jews still benefit from the Holocaust. They take money out of it. They don't leave us alone. We want what is called in German a Schlussstrich, like a final. Uh, final line. We will not, don't want to talk about it, and the Jews are using it. And there's a specific leftist form of this kind of resentment, and this was represented by uh, Kunstelmann, a very famous 1908 and 1968, early 1970s, who was the founder of the Kommune 1, Commune Number no. 1 in Germany, like very important for this kind of. Um, uh, undogmatic leftist uh, uh, fraction, and he said he was talking about the left has to get rid of its, in German, Judenknacks, like their obsession with Jews. And this is specific, um, I think, in Germany, and this distinguishes uh, the German example from the British and other examples. So this would be my short answer. Christine? Yeah, I basically agree. I mean, I think there is a different quality of resentment of this feeling that we're the victims, even sort of now of, of the Jews, uh, that gives us a sort of specific drive to, to these kind of manifestations of anti-Semitism for precisely the reasons that Sebastian has just given. Uh, I also think it's interesting that in different national contexts, Israel always comes to play the role of the murky parts in one's own national past. So, I mean, I know the comparison to, to Nazi Germany is now really ubiquitous, but I think it used to be strongest in Germany, whereas in, in the UK, I see much more Israel as a settler colonial state. And in the, in the US right now, um, the trope of, of uh, white supremacy is, is pretty prominently attached to Israel. I think that's also interesting that it's a way of getting rid of any kind of necessity of self-reflection by projecting it onto Israel. And maybe lastly, I do think that um, what we talked about at, at the end, this, this beginning left-wing self-reflection does have to do also with, of course, an awareness of the Nazi past. So a finally, a, a sort of acknowledgement of a specific a, a specific kind of responsibility of not just doing what, what you rightly suggested, Ivo, that you know this, this is just a sort of continuation. Um, and also maybe just a better understanding, or a more widespread adequate understanding what anti-Semitism actually is, so it makes it easier to recognize it even where it isn't expressed explicitly. Um, so, for example, Jeremy Corbyn kept saying, yeah, but I'm a good anti-racist, um, so of course I can't be an anti-Semite. Now, of course, that completely uh, misrecognizes that what he, what most people mean when they say anti-racism is kind of a form of colonial, post-colonial racism against people of color, which that operates with very different images. So it's usually uh, the racialized other as inferior, as kind of backwards, primitive, um, possessing, if any powers, then usually concrete powers of violence or sexuality or whatever. So it's not this um, phantom of, um, of power and of secret power. And, and that makes, I think, anti-Semitism uh, 
much more attractive for the left or the left is much more liable to to become anti-Semitic, even if it doesn't want to I'll talk about it as if it's one thing, of course, there's many different currents than uh, anti-racist, because if you want to stand up for the underdog, you can't be a racist. But if you want to stand up for the underdog, you can very well combine that with, you know, being opposed to the powerful of the world. Um, and I think, yeah, coming back to the initial question, um, the, I think an understanding, maybe I'm too optimistic, but I think an understanding of, of the fact that that is exactly how anti-Semitism work is by now maybe a little bit more widespread in Germany than what I can see in, in the UK, for example, where it's absolutely, I mean, woefully absent. What really strikes me, and especially, I think Christine mentioned that, you know, one has to think, think about also how the left, you know, the argument that the left are bringing, how the left is thinking about so, such questions. And one of the things that really strikes me uh, in the left discourse today, and uh, uh, Sebastian, I think, mentioned uh, uh, Karl Marx, which, by the way, I very much uh, disagree with your reading of his, uh, uh, of his Judenfrage, but that's another discussion. But basically, you said that one of the things that he pointed out is this tension between, I think, what he back then told, you know, kind of saw as the kind of this tension between, you know, the egoism of Judaism and the kind of a more universalistic aspiration of 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 uh, of, of communism, or you know, his, his teaching, and what we actually today in our language today, and I think that's the kind of the point of how to maybe frame what we are talking about is this very kind of tension between this notion of solidarity and what we today call identity politics, and the fact is that you know people who identify themselves as Jews or how people see Jews, Israel, whatever, doesn't really fit into that. There's a discussion within the left, how much to focus on identity politics. And for example, within the left party, the more traditional orthodox wing of the party, represented by Sarah Wagenknecht, she heavily criticizes the left for putting an emphasis on identity politics. She said, this is a distraction from the social question. We have to deal with the worries of um, the workers, of the unemployed, of the lower classes, and we cannot try to influence like this urban um, ecological milieu of young academics. This is not what we can build on our party on. And she has just published a, a book arguing in this direction. So within the German left, you find a um, discussion about identity politics. But the biggest part, I would argue, of the German left now supports identity politics. Even within like the moderate left, like the SPD, the Social Democratic Party, there was an uh, interview and an article by the former head of the German Bundestag Wolfgang Thierse, who is an old social democrat, and he criticized identity politics, he criticized this policy of language, and he was harshly dismissed by the youth organization of the SPD and by the current head of the party, Saskia Esken, they have a double, double head as two persons on the, the head of the party. So it's still a big discussion um, within the left and I'm not totally sure how to connect this attitudes towards identity politics to uh, anti-Semitism and the attitudes towards Israel and the Jews. Because in, um, in the dogmatic traditional left, you have this classic anti-imperialist view of the world, meaning they are mostly all anti-Israel. Whereas in many parts of uh, this, I would call new left, and doing identity politics, you find uh, big parts being at least not anti-Israel, and sometimes even being pro-Israel. And this, I would argue, is a specific, uh, specific for the German situation, as after the reunification, as Christine has pointed out, a strain within the radical, even in the radical left, has developed that's a staunchly pro-Israel 
and it's pro-Israel and leftist and not uh, despite being leftist. Yeah, I, I don't uh, have to add much, maybe just to say that, that um, well, you've already indicated that things become pretty complicated and contradictory. Um, I mean, one, one aspect of that is obviously also that the right isn't necessarily explicitly anti-Israel anymore, just like uh, in the UK or in France. But uh, of course, they secretly, I'm convinced they still hate the Jews, but the, in this sort of binary opposition, they, they right now they hate the Muslims even more. So they rhetorically support Israel and also because Israel is presented as a strong national ethnic state, which of course the right loves. So, so it, it becomes quite complicated and even the right itself is, I think, often splits on the question of Israel. The identity politics on the left works differently in, in Germany because um, as you implied, I mean, what I see in the UK or the US is that you have a sort of intersectional coalition of all the oppressed identities of the world against the Jews. I mean, as we see, for example, with the fact that um, Jewish feminists were kicked off the Women's March in, in 2020 um, because they were carrying a flag with the Star of David. So, so they were just, you know, kind of excluded from this solidarity of, of the different oppressed groups. And I think it's true that that isn't necessarily the case in Germany. But what I also think uh, is interesting, and you probably know more about that, Sebastian, than I do, um, I wonder what happens right now with the finally the start of, of a German engagement also with its own colonial past, which is absolutely overdue and has come very late, um, and which now again complicates engagements with uh, the Nazi past, because you now have a new competition of memories, uh, you have a debate about, well, can, can German majority society actually dictate to racialized minorities, how they should talk about the Holocaust and, and you know, what, what significance Holocaust memory should have in their worldview and, and all these very complicated and very necessary questions. And yeah, I don't have a sort of um, overarching thesis on that, but I think that's a discussion that is just starting, uh, for example, with, with the debates around um, criticism of Achille Membe, the Cameroonian philosopher and public intellectual. Uh, and that I'm, I'm sure will sort of go on in, in the next few years. And um, yeah, it's, it's both very necessary, but also potentially problematic. What you have pointed out, um, Christina, that people get kicked off demonstrations for having a flag with the Star of David. Of course, you find this in Germany as well. And you find it in the German left as well. And you have this kind of resentment and anti-Israel attitude. But I think the difference is you have resistance against this kind of anti-Israel uh, feelings and anti-Israel actions within the German left. And this is really the interesting story after the reunification. And this has probably only happened in, in the two post-national socialistic states, Germany and Austria, that the left has developed, that considers itself leftist and pro-Israel. And it argues that it's being pro-Israel because it's left. And that this kind of uh, attitude is necessary as a leftist position. I'm always having trouble when I'm discussing with leftists from other nations or other states. They completely don't understand what I'm talking about and call me a rightist and whatever. And, and the interesting phenomenon is what we could see in the last weeks uh, in Germany um, in the, when the Middle East conflict escalated and um, we had all these demonstrations and we had like, you've probably seen the pictures of like young men, mainly some, some women, and mainly immigrant in front of the synagogue in, uh, in the Ruhrgebiet in Gelsenkirchen, more than 100 people shouting, shy Juden, like fucking Jews. They were in front of a synagogue. Israel was leading the war. They were in front of a German synagogue shouting, Scheiß Juden. These were mainly immigrant um, uh, with an immigration background. Of course, many of them were Germans, but they were having Turkish flags, Moroccan flags, and Iraqi flags, and then shouting, Scheiß Juden. And then there was one anti Israel demonstration in Leipzig, and there was a counter demonstration. In the anti-Israel demonstration, several hundred people, mainly with an immigrant background, 
Then you had this anti-anti-Israel demonstration, this pro-Israel demonstration. These were nearly the same number of people, leftists. So you have 100, several hundred people demonstrating with Israel flags, solidarity with Israel. And then you have this anti-Israel demonstration with mainly immigrant people. So these are really strange constellations. And of course you have a big trouble because all people on the pro-Israel demonstration consider themselves anti-racist and often do work for immigrants and are active in solidarity campaigns with asylum seekers, et cetera, et cetera. But so you have this really strange constellation constellations going on right now. That the topic of left-wing anti-Semitism is not one kind of to simply be the left with, but I think as, yeah, as you've probably seen, there is also a self-criticism of the left that I think is necessary because this kind of anti-Semitism isn't just sort of bad for the Jews, but it's clearly also bad for the left, right? And I also think uh, that the left itself has certain theoretical and analytical tools to think about this. Um, so, so that I think, you know, uh, events like this are, are sort of also great to kind of develop that kind of discourse not as one to bash the left over the head, but to, to precisely foster these, these kinds of self-reflexive um, processes. So yeah, thank you very much for, for the opportunity. Uh, thanks for me as well. Uh, I think a lot in a good sense has happened in the German left after the reunification and in a sense of self-reflectiveness, but now there's a danger of a backlash and so the discussion will be going on. All right, thank you very much, uh, all of you. Um, and uh, as we said, we could speak for hours, but we will not uh, at that point. Uh, thank you for this. And uh, our next uh, podcast will be about the situation in the United States. And uh, but that will be announced um, uh, briefly. Uh, thank you very much and have a good day. <laughs>